I'm Jeff Ballinger, I'm head of the platform, and you didn't make a joke about it. Well, I was busy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my colleagues said that's quite funny for somebody to do some work with rail, but I have no idea why. So head of the platform, nine and three quarters was nearly what it was. Um, I just joined a company, which is a very exciting company, I think, called Machines with Vision. I joined them just after Christmas. Um, and we're doing localization for autonomous and managed transport systems. So essentially, for any vehicle within such a system, where is it? Obviously, we've got sensors to vehicles, so this is the Internet of Things. It's the Internet of really big things. Uh, sorry, for my pardon my French. Uh, so, we're going to break this into three parts. Um, and the first part, I want to just give a bit of a feel for our story, you know, what, what it is we're doing in general, in general. So what's the exciting stuff we're doing? How did it come about? Then I'm going to talk about a particular commercial use case, which is our main commercial use case we're working on at the moment, which is to do with maintenance in the rail industry, solving real, real problems for real people and saving them a lot of real money. And then I'm going to switch more to how we're doing it, and I'm going to, for the guys who like Docker, I'm going to talk a bit about how, what, how we're using Docker in a slightly interesting way to drive embedded systems, and why that's actually a good idea and not as crazy as it first sounds. So that's, that's the fun we've got to go. Um, so let's set a general scene. Um, this is what my colleagues who founded the company were thinking about a couple of years ago. They were thinking of this general problem of we've got all these new things coming up. We've got automated, automated autonomous cars, we've got managed rail systems, all these things interacting together. And running that world is going to be quite difficult. And one of the fundamental things that's difficult is to coordinate it, you need to know where things are. And you need to know it better than just about any than any existing localization system, or you will end up with things going very badly. So people have been thinking about this, and they're often now thinking about it in terms of sensors on the vehicles. So lidars and things like that are a classic example of what people are working on in autonomous, um, and they're using it to map the environment around the vehicle, find where all the things are. And uh, for a lot of good reasons, you go to that kind of stuff. The use cases like avoidance of things which you don't expect to be there. You definitely want things like LiDAR involved. But to make autonomous of any of these things work, you need a wide variety of different sensors, and that will be a theme. Um, but we're, but it's, there's not such an emphasis on infrastructure-based systems, because as soon as you get into big wide area systems, they're like the only one that really has any meaning at all as GPS or any of the equivalent satellite systems. Um, if you're not, if you're outside of controlled environments, and as we know, those are fairly limited in their accuracy, particularly if you're going to throw tons of metal around the environment and hopefully not squish people, <laughs> which is always a good thing. But this, this is going back to how people have navigated for years. This is not new. People have been following, you know, they've been taking sensors like your eyes, and sensors like a compass. You're using sensors in the environment. I won't, I'm good at feeling like <laughs> Just <laughs> no, I mean, it, was, it, was, it would have been ironic if you. It, it would have been not the edge. <laughs> no, it's, it's the sensors are working well. Exactly. The, the heel sensor. The heel sensor is good. Sorry, it makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> well, you take the money's in risk management at times. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen enough presentations here. Seen yeah. enough people. Do not go off. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're, we're good. We're good. Um, so you yeah, now have to think about. Sorry. It's all good. Uh, so, set, set, so using these sensors to work out where you are, not that, that, that sort of thing. So my colleague who founded the company was cycling along the canal by the canal one day, coming into code base, down it comes out, comes in right time by that, that sort of route, and was just thinking about how are you going to solve this problem, he was thinking hard, staring down through his bicycle handlebars, and looked down at the surface underneath the bike, and went, that is a unique fingerprint of where I am. That was the sort of the, 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 the aha moment that led to this company, which has which now been grown. And he then, prompt, I'm assured it wasn't close to related to this, but he then that day did accidentally cycle into the canal, so his own localization isn't so good. <laughs> but uh, I thought it was quite funny, but yeah. <laughs> apparently I should be more sympathetic. Um, so that, 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 that was the core observation. Alongside that core observation, these the guys who Anthony and Tim and Jan who founded the company, they're, they're, they're machine vision guys, robotics guys. And they, they were interested in a new piece of technology that's coming along. So you get, pro, you get new observation, you get problems, and you get a new piece of technology. And that technology is event-based vision. Ordinary cameras, like the big chunky one back there, even though that's creating video, so it's, it's, frame, it's, it's, got, a, it's got disks between frames it's recording, 
Um, actually, that, that, is, that is working on a frame by frame by frame sort of basis. It's all about whole frames. Your camera sensor is a single sensor working completely synchronized. That is fine when you're moving as fast as I am now. That, is, that works fairly well. I'm sure we're probably getting quite a decent picture on that camera. We'll look at it, the, the video later to find out. Um, but if you're even going at quite a modest speed over a road surface, pointing a camera at the road surface, I am at 30 miles per hour, the road surface is moving under you at 13 meters per second. And yes, I did crypt that off my notes. <laughs> Don't remember details like that. that. That is very difficult for that sort of sensor to, 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 to handle because you, you record a whole image, you unload it off the sensor, there's a bit of a pause, and then you do your next whole image. So effectively, you're getting a snapshot, and you're getting a snapshot, and you're getting a snapshot. You're not really getting a continuous thing fingerprint of what's on the ground underneath you. Um, and these sensors work the opposite way. Each individual pixel is completely independent and asynchronous. Each of them, whenever its level goes up or down by a certain amount, generates what's called an event, which says I'm at this position on the sensor and I've just seen this level change. And those are then streamed off asynchronously to produce a stream of events. And that is what event cameras are. They're very, very bad at giving pictures that you can work out what it is, but they're very, very good at rapidly streaming a fingerprint of the surface you're moving over. And so that's what we do. We point our cameras downwards, we point with our event cameras, we go at great speed across this sort of surface, and we get a fingerprint of what that ground surface is from which we can build a map. At the moment, that's probably feeling a bit sort of floaty, a bit hard to get hold of, so here's a nice little picture of it. This was the first experiment they did, right at the start of the company, the first really successful, it all coming together. And they had a couple of runs of this robot, and you've got the fingerprint on the right. They all, oh, it's all in orange, that's the fingerprint they'd originally taken from the first run, and then when they used it in the second run to work out where the robot was relative to that, to that first run. It's gonna work, yay. So we'll do that again. And as you see, it's tracking its way up, using the little bit it's looking at, and matching that to the fingerprint of the map. And that is fundamentally how our stuff works. But it definitely depends on the weather, right? So Say again? It, it will definitely depend on the weather. Like if it's yes. snowing it, or... If, 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 if it snows, we'll come, to, I'll, I'll, we'll come back to that. Because we, we regularly get asked what happens when it snows on a railway. Um, and, and the answer is... Nothing. <laughs> the the trains don't run, so it's not really a big problem. But you, you, but you always get... There's always, you, it's not, it doesn't have to be complete. Your finger, but you, as long as you have enough features coming through, you then, correct, you then correct again. And what you're doing is a series of corrections. I've got a picture of the map later, which will explain that. So over the last couple of years, we've gone through what you might call the, the more research-heavy phase of the R&D process. Uh, but do some quite good, fun stuff. Initially, Deutsche Bahn, uh, with their real maintenance guys, who looked at this and said, yeah, no, that's something we want in our trains, please. Um, but actually, the first thing we did was with the cars. That picture of the car there, which is on the 2018 poster, is because in the 2016 round, that's, we, we put that on the side of a car to do initial vehicle-based exploration of this kind of tech. That led to the Deutsche Bahn. And then more recently, as our first sort of real big, big ticket deployment of it with Network Rail, they're giving us that nice little train to play with, which is fantastic fun. But all of these are localization of these vehicles. It's where is this vehicle? So. That's all been fun, and it's great fun stuff, but why do people want to pay us to do this? So let's talk about problems people have, going back to the point. Because it's all great, great to have tech, but real maintenance. You've got those big yellow trains you saw. They rumble around the countryside, going across the railway, up every two weeks for main lines, every about four to six weeks for, around for smaller lines in the UK, and similar in Germany. Germany's got a fleet of about nine of them, we've got two or three. Um, so which is why we did it in Germany first. Fun, same fundamental problem. They, they, they don't have location technology which is good enough to give them real predictive maintenance. Now let me expand on that slightly. Every run of one of these trains, they're collecting data from a whole pile of sensors. I mean, that's not a real sensor, they're on the train. But they have an equivalent of that, a laser, laser distance scanner going at great rate under the train all the time it's running. They have vibration sensors, they've got all kinds of, all kinds of technology which they are running as they go along monitoring the condition of the line. Then they run it again two weeks later, and they get another set of data. 
of all of those great sensors. At the moment, they don't have location technology which is good enough to align those data sets to say which point in which data set is equivalent to the point in the other data set. And they get it within a couple of metres, but that is not good enough for this sort of work. Now, predictive, great, that's, that's the icing on the cake, but let's just take a simple case where you take a measurement of a track being slightly out of tolerance in width, and what you want to know is, is it 5% out of tolerance and it stayed 5% out of tolerance? which you can probably shrug, move on, and deal with the next time that bit's scheduled to be dug up. If it's 5% out of tolerance, and it's 2% out of tolerance last time, and it's 7% out of tolerance next time, you probably need to dig it up next week. At the moment, they can't tell the difference, so they dig it up next week. Digging up the railway is an expensive hobby. They really, it's a really, really expensive hobby. Compared to the amount of this project it's costing, it's, yeah, we're, it's extremely expensive. So they are very, very keen to solve this problem to get that accurate comparison of data between the runs. Now there's all kinds of other things you can do, like the use case we talked us about, about checking whether maintenance has been done, because then if your map changes, if, if you retamp a section of railway, then the map will change for that section, and our map update software, which I'll talk about a bit later, will notice that, and you can immediately tell which section's been retamped. Was it the section you expected? Was it the, uh, up, the, up the other end of the line, because that was nearest the pub? You can now tell, <laughs> which we like. Now, very quick one, which is going to be slightly, out, probably slightly out of my comfort zone and lots of graphs, but this will hopefully just approach your question. So think, think about the real use case. Come across to this end. Here is the technology currently used to say exactly where you are on the railway. And it's a very solid bit of technology. It's a lump of metal which has got some kit inside it which will tell when the, that train runs over it. So you will know precisely when, where you are when you go over one of those. So your error at that bottom corner of the graph, immediately after you've gone to one of those, is zero. You know precisely where you are. It's been RTK'd, it's, it's exactly located. That's fine. Those are expensive and get stolen a lot. So that is a bit of a problem. Railway, railway infrastructure you leave out on the track often doesn't stay there. <laughs> um, so that, there can be quite big gaps. You've got about typically in their kit they have on trains at the moment, you get about a 5% motion error, motion estimation error, because of wheel slip, axle counters not being quite perfectly aligned, all that kind of stuff. It's all done based on, on axle rotation. Um, so you quite rapidly grow your error from that nice and accurate up to your GNSS, your GPS error boundary. And that, from that point on, you're limited on your GPS error boundary. Until this point here, where I'll try not to jump off and land on the down there. That way you join into a tunnel. <laughs> GPS doesn't work very well in tunnels. GPS doesn't work very well in urban corridors either. GPS doesn't work around right behind trees quite often. It, so your, your error then goes off, off into this. Now you'll notice in the bottom is us. Funnily enough, we're staying but almost perfectly accurate on that scale all the time. So I now need to justify that to you. And basically, there's two parts to the justification. One is that we are, because we can, one of the features of our, of our, of our, of our visual, vision based system is we can accurately estimate speed, much more, and it's absolute speed over the observed ground. You therefore, your error grows much more slowly. It grows at 1% approximately. Also, if you're going across the fingerprint of the thing you have measured previously, you are constantly correcting yourself. So effectively, you've got those boards virtual versions of those boards spread across the whole of your railway. And therefore we go along the bottom and it, on that scale as they say is essentially flat. Two percent it's two two centimetre actually as you go. When it's snowed, what happens is you'll t you might have some section of line fairly well obscured by snow. As you go across that section of line it will grow at its one percent. So you'll still get motion estimation because there's enough features in the snow to give you your, your speed your old geometry, but you'll obviously not be getting your corrections until you next go under, go under a bridge. You go, you'll always find places where enough features come through to correct, and typically it's a bit of a guesstimate until we get these things more and more in use over a winter, but we're thinking you might start creeping out to sort of a few meters inaccurate in those very challenging conditions. Still better than any alternatives. So we took that to Deutsche Bank, and I'll show you a bit of video, which is part of our 
poor driver. So when we started the Deutsche Bahn, where we were starting with the sensor, which we built on the first car, and that's the car version hanging on the side of a car going along. This was taking that sensor and just clipping it onto the train. So that's a very unique thing. I mean, it's basically a little event camera pointing at it, going through a mirror, again, while we're facing a big lamp beside it. Single camera set up in this. That's a slightly more machined version of the same thing that they actually allow it to run on the train for a distance, and that's the train we put it on. And then that's it in place on the train, pointing, hitched in nicely, and then compared to the rest of the train kit, it's such a little neat little thing. Our, our newer stuff we're building now is much more real scale. That's from the founder, that's Tim working on it. This is the slightly, this is the as I say, research level. It's, it's, <laughs> it's gaffer tape and, and stuff. Now we start doing some, doing some runs, initially some fairly short runs on test lines, and then a proper 30 kilometer up to 200 kilometers per hour run along their network. Which, yeah, nice ride on the train, and here is that. Those are those, those events I'm talking about being captured in real time. And those are used to construct the maps, which you then use to match against. I think this will probably run on for a while. It's interesting, you, you can see enough in the, ma in the data, in the event data, even when you lay it out to see where your, your, your uh, features are. Things like points and such, short, too short. So you build so a whole map like that, it's a whole map that you might have downloaded as a single map or a section of line. And then you use it, obviously, to do your, your actual run across the line. My timing right against the, the blur that's on the actual video coming on you. Now you obviously have more to say at this point. And do the actual localization. And the localization is taking, them, taking that map and using the query data we're seeing from the camera right now, the, all of the scattering of black points gives you an idea of the error that, that will occur in this sort. But you'll notice it's quite nice and small still. And that, is, that gives you your localization as you go. And as you're going down the line, the blue and green points are various GNSS type sources. Um, interesting things to notice is how many more points we're getting and how our points are actually running down a railway line. <laughs> which the real guys are quite keen on it, running down a railway line. Um, and we, so we, in those trials, we got two centimeter accuracy on that, on that longer run at real speed. And Deutsche Bahn were delighted and we're putting something, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say it, we're putting something on their train this summer as well, doing the proper one. So that was, that was all the research type stuff. So that, now we've taken that and we're going to deploy it with Network Rail and with Deutsche Bahn. Uh, and it's a product called Real Lock. Um, this is where the geeks will start getting excited. We've got some nice technology in this stack to solve these nice problems and earn some money, but this nice technology as well for the guys who like the technology. Um, we are using an also an NVIDIA kit down in the sensor itself. We have what the NVIDIA Jetson TX2, um, which is an ARM64 based system, but with uh, 256 CUDA cores latched on the side in a nice Thing you can run, you, you can run it, but you can run it at the end of a power over Ethernet, which is convenient. We're all, we don't do any separate power into it, it's all power over Ethernet. So that's the sensor underneath. The other parts of the, that, that's one piece. The second, next piece is the engine, which is where the heavy duty computing happens. So the real localization will happen up there. So sensor attached to the second right at the bottom, does data fusion, data reduction down there. Up at the engine, you do your real localization, so the heavy, the heavy searching. And obviously that searching has to be done against maps. Those maps are managed via the cloud service, which, is, uh, w which can then also do lots of nice offline GPS corrections to really get your ground truth, which is something I'm carefully not trying to talk about because it's one of the more complicated bits and I don't really understand it. Um, how, how, you, how you bind that in to get your, not just have comparison between maps, but have absolute location. Um, my, one of my colleagues, more technically able colleagues, will explain that to anybody who really, really wants to know. Um, that doesn't have to be contained. Now, we all know what Wi-Fi on trains is like, um, and we are used effectively to put Wi-Fi on trains to get this back. So that's not a continuous backhaul. You need your map tiles for the journey <coughs> you're going to do at the start of the run. This could be side-loaded in the depot. At the end of the run, you've got your differences found against those map tiles, which you need to take back off. So this can be done depot to depot. We're hoping to be able to do it a bit more live than that. That's something we'll see as we, as we move it full, into full production. Um, also, we're doing some nice, G nice GPU in the big box as well. Probably one of the new ones, the T4. It's got three and a half, three and a half thousand CUDA cores, I believe. That's, 
a slightly stripped down version of what the new sensor looks like, going to look like. It's a much more substantial bit of kit. It's got two cameras, two light sources, so it's going to use stereo to get height, to, to, to get good height estimation about the track, because even on trains you've got a reason why suspension travel, so if you want to be accurate, you want that stereo effect. Um, the other amusing bit, if you're into IT gadgetry, is if you look at the size of the connector, that is a connector about this big, and it is to run six Ethernet cables. And that is the smallest connector you can put on a train that will run six Ethernet cables, if you want the, out on the outside of a train. They, they, they believe in them, and, and I can hardly lift the damn thing. It's a that big solid metal. Really quite really inter interesting stuff. Um, so that's all hardware geekery. Now I'm going to plunge into the software. This is a challenging thing. So a system to write software for. Now, it's obviously very valuable. We've got a great commercial use case. We've got some great hardware to run it on. But this thing is in a train, or the other version we've got are in cars. That is usually running down a railway line, a railway somewhere at some funny hour of the night. And I don't want to be sitting on that train all the time. Though I may end up some of the, some, some of the time there. It is, I describe it as semi year gaps, because if you've ever used train Wi Fi, you know the state that's in. It's not a system where you can rely on connectivity. Um, one thing I, I don't know if it's obvious in that previous diagram is that for it's a multi-architecture system because if you want the heavy the heavyweight Intel compute up above to do the localization, and if you're doing stuff in the center, that's got to be ARM really. So it's a multi-architecture thing, and this is though we're moving towards the D of development. This is still an R&D project. This stuff will run very very different software in the first week than it will we'll run in the last week of this project. So it has to be able to be changed quickly. Software stack we're using is probably at the top the kind of stuff you'd imagine if you'd done any robotics or, 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 or vision type stuff before. Um, plug it all together with ROS, because ROS just kind of just works. It's a message passing system, pub, pub sub type system. It means you can have lots of little individual components, single purpose, which then just connect into the message bus. Kind of like your enterprise message buses you would use in enterprise, but aimed at this sort of a system. Um, so what kind of things we'll have is we'll have drivers for the cameras, we'll have drivers for the sensors, and they're all in the stack which is on the sensor piece. And then we've got the big compute stack which has got the command and control going on. And in our initial system, the first I put up first, we'll just have data capture going on. Uh, obviously that will then rapidly expand to do local, localization and all that as, that as that lands onto there. That's the piece that we're changing most, so there'll be a lot of components landing on that side. All of those are running in containers, which is a clue of the technology we're using. You probably saw the top title, so you know it's going to be Docker. Um, then on that, I run those on a Docker swarm, so that I can manage those as a single individual entity across this. This is two compute units, but I might have more. But I run it as one entity. Um, underneath, it starts getting a lot more standard again. Your know, Rackbox has just got Ubuntu on it. So exciting, so, <laughs> so normal, no problem. Uh, the bit that's a bit different is if you're getting from like a Jetson that has a slightly non-standard operating system which is Ubuntu based, um, but there are differences. We'll come to the challenges in a bit. The pluses of using of, of using Swarm. Uh, who here's used Swarm mode in the Docker? Put the Docker hands up. Who's used Swarm mode before? Yeah. So you know, you know, you know, you know what it gives you. It is basically, it's, it's a system which isn't, it, 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 will, it will converge towards the specification of, you have declared, declared the specification of a layout of a system you have given it. So you declare a, 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 set, a structure of a system, and this is something which is in a text file, um, which you can then have under version control and all those nice things, which, come to, which says which components, which pieces of salt, which, which containers, what configurations, what other parameters, and all of those things together. Um, if anything happens, for example, the power drops to that sensor bar, which I'm confident will happen sometime or other, probably quite, possibly even quite often, we'll have to find out. Um, it's Cat7 power, it's cat carrying power over Ethernet, going down to do a pole on the bottom of a train. Um, when that resets itself, it has to converge as rapidly as possible back little accents back there. Uh, <laughs> it was too exciting a conversation. <laughs> it will converge itself back to the state you want it in. And that 
conversions when I am not there telling it to do it or having to restart anything, that sorting itself out back to the defined state is really, really useful in this context. Obviously, Docker, this sort of stuff in Swarm is useful in when you're running lots of things on cloud servers as well. But in this, when you can't just guarantee to get to it, it's, it's really, really good. Um, <coughs> we can run a local registry at the end. I'm possibly not going to do that. I think it's not a step too far. Docker's cache is perfectly good for the sort of for the use for the container images. Just push things into the cache on the individual machines. But there is a nice safe deployment mechanism, which is simply sneaker net. I turn up at the depot with one of the trains there, and with my laptop, I attach it to the network, and then I can push images into the Docker cache on the various machines, and I can give the swarm a new definition and off it will go. The one at the top is actually probably one of the really important things for this kind of system, is you're not actually putting anything complicated in the core install on any of these machines. They are utterly vanilla. The operating system, Docker, and nothing else. So that keeps it really clean. All your complexity is in the container images which you work out in your development lab and bring to the site. And that's definitely the right way around. If anybody's done embedded projects before, they probably enjoy disasters when you don't do that. Final one, Edinburgh is a tough place to hire people in. Developer familiarity makes developers happy if we're trying to get people in and to join the team. And that's, that's quite an important aspect as well. So that's all positives. I'm now going to do the but. There are some rough edges when trying to use Docker, shoehorn Docker into this situation. Um, it's, it's not as bad as it was, but the NVIDIA hardware, uh, it, it's, a bit, it's a bit different from standard PCs, and the way the Linux is built, image is built for it is a bit different from standard PCs. Um, at the moment, your off-the-shelf image will work on most of the carrier boards to which you can apply these modules, because the NVIDIA embedded stuff comes as the compute unit, the Jetson itself, which, if we go back to my picture, the silver bit on top is the Jetson. The thing on the bottom is the, is the carrier board providing all the I.O. connectivity into it. Um, it's not a CPU, Jetson, it's not a CPU, it's an integrated system of CPU chipset and a few other bits and bobs. But it's, it's, it's divided in a slightly unnatural place compared to how you do x86 systems. Uh, that carrier board is built by a little company called Colorado, Colorado Engineering, who otherwise make military radars. That you can get carrier boards from a variety of places. And what we've discovered is some carrier boards will break Docker just by putting the Jetson on that carrier board because they have a slightly different configuration of the operating system because they have a different set of devices and they break stuff that Docker depends on. So it's not quite just plug and play. You can trip over things. You've also seen on some of the pictures of have been showing pictures of nice GPGPU type hardware. Obviously, we want to run that at some point. That's, that's a lot of the point of having it in there. Wouldn't, wouldn't spend two and a half thousand pounds on a GPGPU guard unless I was wanting to get some, some value out of it. So that has to be run from software sitting inside of those containers, in those ROS, those modules, those ROS nodes, inside of Docker containers. I don't know how, how people try to do that. You, your issue is that the device, the GPU device is on the host and you've got to bring that device through into the container and it's a bit, that, that's a bit delicate. That's something it's possible to do but it's very easy to get wrong. It's definitely not again, a, not just plug and play, it's a bit, it can be a bit fiddly and it'll be device to device. Also, and you might have noticed we've got cameras attached to these, they connect over USB. Come on, Docker Run, you can do my device and bring your devices through. Do you know, or dev bus USB to dev bus USB, typically. Um, and that works, and that works fairly well. But you can't do that in a swarm. So you would have thought that means I can't use swarm, wouldn't you? What you can actually do, and this is a horrific hack, which I hate to admit to, and I'm trying to do it in a nicer way, is the note, I start off a container in the swarm whose only purpose is to, I map the Docker socket through from the host up into that container and then I use a docker run as a static command within that container to do my full docker run with the minus dev. <laughs> it's nasty, but it works. 
but it's still, there's still, you know, it's not quite intended for this use, I guess is my point. You're going to have to overwork your way around on these rough edges if you start pushing it out of its comfort zone. These forum guys have been talking about doing proper device support for ages, but it's just, that's not their core use case. And they, they worry about security and things, which in, towards, in the internals of this system, I don't give a whatever about security because it's a closed box system. Um, so inside my system, everything trusts. <coughs> boundary and outward is totally different, but totally different. You have to know where your boundary is. But it, internally, I'm not worried. But the swarm guys, obviously, in terms of the stuff that they're typically deploying on cloud, security at the level of the container is important. And that's why it's difficult for them. Thanks for listening, everybody. If anybody's interested in this sort of stuff, I'll just note very briefly that we are hiring. Um, as, as you always have to do at this point, when you're a little company, I mean, we're, we've got six people in here. Hiring, too, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting difference. How many people are in the UK in Pride Project? Uh, 23.4,000. Yeah, we've we got six people in the office at the moment. We've got two new starts coming and coming uh, in the next couple of months, and we'll be continuing to hire after that. And just always happy to chat about this stuff. And uh, anybody's interested in robotics, vision, anything like that? Thank you, Ranch.